we focused on making uh, neural networks be more biologically accurate. So one of the specific projects that I worked on was implementing latency between neurons and implementing uh, spike, neuronal spiking, where brain neurons really don't have a gradient of a value between, say, zero and one. It's either on or off. The research to make these kinds of neural networks where neurons are either on or off is very new. And I was very happy to be at the cutting edge of this kind of research. So my project right now is making this, these kinds of cells for oxytocin. We have very good cells for vasopressin, and now we want to make these kinds of sensors for oxytocin. The, this will be very useful to see where these neurotransmitters actually move in the brain, and this will allow us to study the brain more in depth. No, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we, and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, two, one. Ni everybody. Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site in the beautiful Beijing, China, at the Peking University School of Life Sciences. We are now going to be talking with Anthony Simonoff. Hello. Nice to meet you again, I guess. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Very excited to be here. You are so welcome, brother. I'm so pumped for this. Absolutely. It's going to be great. Yeah, it was great to meet you. It was so cool knowing that you were coming here from Chicago over the summer to do and research here at PKU. And it was great to meet you. And so I'm pumped for this convo. For those that don't know, Nancy's background. He's a researcher in the Lee Lab at Peking University School of Life Sciences focused on engineering fluorescent sensors for neurotransmitters. And you can find the links in the bio below to yulonglilab.org as well as his LinkedIn profile. All right, let's start things off by asking you one of our favorite questions. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Uh, I have, hmm, this is a very, as I'm sure you know, very broad topic. So I'll touch on a few things that I think about it. Um, you, the, like the world, I guess is like for me, what I think about it is the direction that uh, people are giving, giving to it, excuse me. So what that means is like eh, all of us collectively, like where are we going? Well, I don't know if anyone really knows. We have kind of scientific stuff that we're doing. We're doing other, well, especially for me, because I'm a researcher, there's also a cultural and musical and all of the other kinds of experiences that people are doing and living and constructing on a daily basis, which um, I hope are <laughs> put down for a good cause and they will allow people to live happier, healthier, and better lives in the future. Um, so <laughs> long story short, I think the direction of the world is for a more prosperous, more peaceful kind of society where people are just live happier lives, more fulfilling. What do you think is the core skill that we should embody to make sure it's peaceful and harmonious and move forward? Uh, um, I don't think there is one specific skill that we say, okay, everyone, you need to learn how to be a, be a farmer, and then everyone will be happy. What about a good to... person? But there's not one specific skill, right? <laughs> At least. Be nice, uh, be kind. Maybe, be yeah. Be loving. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, disagreements always have existed in human history but it's how we overcome those disagreements and what we do in order to peacefully establish some kind of resolution that will really make a difference, I feel, in the future. Yeah. Let's hit your journey. So you're born in Chicago. Yes, sir. And you picked up piano when you were like five, is that right? Yeah, actually, right around, well, when I was four, technically. Yeah. So right around that time. I've been playing ever since. It's been an amazing journey for the past, what, 14 years now? Yeah. Yeah. 14 years of piano playing since you were four years old. Okay, and then, yeah, how, how does this all end up happening that you pick up music when you're young, then you pick up your interest in science and computer science? So tell us about who you were when you were young and how you picked those things up. Well, for piano, it was mostly my parents because no you know, little toddler wants to sit and play piano for hours a day. So that I have to ascribe to my parents and <laughs> thank you for uh, introducing me to this world of music. Uh, for kind of neuroscience and machine learning, the kinds of other stuff that I've done, I've always been interested in the brain. I read a great one, uh, book called Goodell Escherbach by Douglas Hofstadter, 
it's really opened my eyes to the possibilities of you know exploring the brain and exploring the kind of computer science aspects of it. So, um, especially over the course of my childhood, I would read more kind of science fiction novels to see where like uh, to see where artificial intelligence and similar technologies could go. And then once I got to college, I was able to actually work in a lab, uh, modeling making. Models for the human brain, which was very exciting. So then, when you got to college, you picked neuroscience. Yeah. So the University of Chicago does not, unfortunately, have an artificial intelligence major. So I chose the next best thing, which is to be a neuroscience major, as well as focusing on um, computer science in my well, free time. It's more involved with me working in a lab. Um, I worked in David Friedman's computational neuroscience lab. We focused on making uh, neural networks be more biologically accurate. So one of the specific projects that I worked on was implementing latency between neurons and implementing uh, spike, neuronal spiking, which is really what happens in the brain, where brain neurons really don't have a gradient of a value between, say, 0 and 1. It's either on or off. And uh, the research to make these kinds of neural networks where neurons are either on or off is very new. And I was very happy to be at the cutting edge of this kind of research. All right, let's unpack this more. This is an interesting aspect to our conversation. So let's start by explaining what do you mean neural networks and biology? How do you see those things? What is their relationship? I think in, in the past and even up to now, neural networks are well, they're called neural networks. They're based on human brains. Their purpose is to learn. They're, they have singular units called neurons. Um, and they're very similar to the brain in a lot of ways and very different and even more. So well, they're similar because they're neurons and they're connected and we can model some areas of the brain relatively well. Unfortunately, we don't understand the brain well enough to model all of it yet. And the similarity, so, and that's about where the similarities to the biological side end, I feel. So you have, for neural networks, they can process way more data than a brain can because they're built in computers. And as computing power grows, it will only grow in size and strength and complexity. So this is where you get the fears of AI taking over the world, from the Matrix to Elon Musk's recent tweets. So you have this kind of once you have this kind of super intelligence that can process and do way more data computationally than a human can, there's, it, it can take over the world. We are nowhere near there yet, but uh, it's a possibility. All right, so let's revisit the structure of this. So we artificially create a neural network in a computer. Yes. Yeah. OK. So these are models. They're, um, their backbone is a lot of linear algebra, where it's just pure math. So the most stereotypical example is you feed it a handwritten number, and then the uh, network will output whether it thinks the number is 0 through 9, which is actually way harder to do programmatically than you'd expect, which is why this has only been a recent development. OK, so let's walk us through that example. So then when I write the number 2 on a little sheet of paper, mm -hmm. and then I take an image of it, and then I feed it through the neural network, the first thing that it's doing is, is it's scanning it pixel by pixel? Like, what is, it, what is it doing? And then how is it creating an idea of what so, the answer is? Yeah, so neural networks, the, yeah, so in, in essence, that's what's happening. It, you're taking it this little picture. I think it's. 16 by 16 pixels? I could be off. But it, it takes this picture, and then there, the neural networks have what are called hidden layers. So they're layers where you don't really know what they're doing. You might hypothetically think that, oh, if we have three of these hidden layers, the first one will look at kind of where the pixels are arranged on the screen. And the second one will look for maybe a curve at the top or like the straight line at the bottom. And then the third layer will combine all of the, this information together and then output the information that it sees. But we don't actually know if this is what's happening. We, obviously, you can analyze it, but just by looking at the neural network itself, you have, we have no idea how it makes these calculations. So yes, to answer your question, you, it scans it pixel by pixel. Or sorry, it stores all of these pixels in some kind of memory format. 
and then it does a bunch of calculations on these pixels with certain weights and biases within these hidden layers, and then outputs a probability of what this answer is. So it will say, okay, I think that it's a one with maybe 1% probability, and a zero with 2% probability, but I think it's a two with 97% probability, or there's a 97% chance that this is a two. And that's how you train this neural network to get, give you a good answer. Mm. So the hidden layers are doing some sort of analysis on the image. Yes. Yeah. And then you have to train those hidden layers to do these specific aspects of the analysis. Yeah. So it's like an if curve, then this, mm. stuff like that. What is it, what is it like then? Not, not really. It's not if curve, then this. The hidden layers, they're, uh, they're called hidden because they do whatever they want. And the way you train these hidden layers is you, OK, at the end, maybe. Because those if then statements are like hard. Hard coded. Are yeah. hard coded. And you, these, you have to be really flexible with these hidden layers. You, because Absolutely. there's going to be tons of examples of what that curve can look like. So it's not going to be just an if then. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So the way it works is an algorithm called backpropagation, where you feed the, let's say you write a two and you feed it to the network. And then the network says it's a five. And you're like, well, no, this is a two. And I want you to lower this error. And the way this error lowering works is there's a gradient kind of it does what's called the gradient descent. And it goes down this kind of gradient of um, probabilities. And eventually you feed it enough numbers and it will go down kind of low enough in this like inverse parabola to the low point where the probabilities are, uh, where the probabilities have little error. And so that's where you get the accurate answers. Okay. So back propagation is telling the neural network that you are you were wrong and then we need to tweak a certain hidden layer yes in order to increase efficiency yeah pretty mm -hmm. much okay okay and then when you do the tweaking is it a what does the tweaking of a hidden layer look like is it changing the linear algebra the math is that what you're saying well, the math is Essentially the same. It's changing the values. Changing so, the values in okay. the math. In the math, yeah. So each each neuron uh, has what's called a weight and a bias. So a weight is a number that you multiply the input by. So for example, if my input is five and my weight is two, then I multiply by two and I get a ten. Um, and a bias is what you add on to this final value. Mm. So if my so five times two is ten, and then say my bias is three. Right, so then 10 plus 3, so then my value of this neuron, after whatever inputs go into it, is a 10. Which was 2. So 2 uh, times 13, 5, yeah. So your input was 2 and your output was 13. Yes. And so what is the significance of weights and uh, biases? Well, I used large numbers to, as an easy example. All of these numbers would actually between, be between 0 and 1. Yeah. So. The purpose of these... Meaning 0% or 100% is... Uh, that's only for the last layer, like the okay. answer. Um, and for the, it's not really a percentage. It's just a value between 0 and 1. Okay. For all the hidden layers up until the last layer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so each... Uh, yeah, so with each kind of input and weight, the, what it means is that the, this specific neuron out of however many hundreds you have can change kind of, of the data flowing through it, it changes it either up or down. And then by the time it flows through all of these hundreds of neurons, by the end of just your 10 neurons, zero through nine, then that's where you have the kind of probability scale of this is not this number, not this number, but it's this one kind of thing. Okay, so my values in the math are where I change weights and biases yes. on all the neurons. Yeah, and then, so back propagation, there's also this thing, this thing called a cost function or a loss function, which is kind of how far you are away from the actual answer. And back propagation is a kind of tool that lowers this, the value of the loss function. So your error is less. And it does this by going back up the hidden layers and tweaking the weights and biases in such a way as to lower the loss function value pretty much. 
so I can make an algorithm that will go and tweak the math to make it so that my answers are more efficient? Yes. Yeah, and then you feed it hundreds or thousands of examples, and then by the end, it becomes very good at analyzing, oh, this is a two, or a five, yeah. or a cat, or a dog, or whatever Google is doing nowadays. So the first example we gave was like ImageNet, where it's numbers and, and pictures. Yes. Yeah, and now that's already classifying at unprecedented rates, obviously, mm -hmm. with greater efficiency than humans do due to sheer, we sleep eight hours, we get hungry, we get emotional, we can only do one at a time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there's also different, different kinds of technologies, like, for example, speech translation or speech recognition. For uh, Alexa and Siri are also built on similar kinds of networks. They're not exactly the same, they're obviously more complex. Um, so natural language processing also takes something like the word mom yeah and then it feeds that into a neural network that has mm -hmm. hidden layers that is trying to yeah take the audio that i emitted mm -hmm. that sound wave yeah so if you say for example hey siri call mom and i'm sorry to any viewers who actually called mom right now um, <laughs> oh, that's funny <laughs> yeah, yeah that actually the device at home actually calls mom yeah at that time. <laughs> calling call mom yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> or even better maybe you should call your mom right now yeah, yeah tell her you love her right now that would be a great idea <laughs> but yeah so when i say hey alexa or hey siri call mom what what it does is it takes the sound wave and it does a bunch of it, all the peaks and valleys, it analyzes all of this data. And then by the end, after you know, all of this math that was put on it, and I don't know the details, I don't think uh, Amazon or uh, Apple will ever, ever let us know the exact details of what happens. By the end, it, it sends the command to your phone to call your mom. Right. So this, is, this obviously still has a long way to go as a lot of people still don't, well, Alex and Siri still obviously aren't perfect, uh, but it's come a really long way, especially in the past few years. Yeah, so the first thing is then it would take this call, or mm -hmm. call, or call. Yeah. And so there's all these different ways to say it, but then that, that first command is there. It's like, okay, with 90% accuracy, we know he said call. Mm -hmm. And then the second word was mom. Yeah. Okay, and then so then it's fine. So this is this is hmm this is tough. So then it's feeding the data from the peaks and the valleys of the sound wave through the neural network and the neural network is then analyzing with weight and bias on different neurons going through mm -hmm. the hidden layers that this is the it might be a different kind of style of neural network instead of just having layers and numbers and biases. What are the different styles of neural networks? So I'll just list a few. The most, uh, the one that most people think about, and which is the one you hear about in like introduction to neural networks 101 class, is what's called a convolutional neural network. You have an input layer of however many neurons, and you have hidden layers, uh, each have however many neurons, and then you have an output layer. So they're kind of stacked one on top of another. Now. The other kind, the one... And it goes through linearly. Yes. Yeah. And it just goes forward, and then the back propagation goes backwards. There's no yeah, yeah. communication between neurons in the same um, layer. Uh, convolutional neural networks, neurons don't talk to each other in the same layer. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They just move the data from the first layer to the second through mm -hmm. those hidden layers and yeah. out the... Yeah. So there's no communication... Vertically. 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 Yeah. Um, one style of neural network that does allow for this communication is what's called the recurrent neural network. So you have your input layer, and then you feed your data into like, a good way to describe it is kind of like, imagine a box where all of the neurons are connected to each other, and they all talk to each other. And then you iterate on this box a few times, and then you output it. So this is... It's called recurrent because all of the neurons are talking to each other in yeah. this kind of box. So it would be like if the convolutional neural network would 
hit like one of the hidden layers and then say, hey, hey, hold on, slow down, let's go back to the second hidden layer. And, and that would be more like what a recurrent neural network would be doing, would be having those neurons talking to each other to produce the best answer instead of go through it linearly. Actually, yes. very, very close. Yeah, so it, this is basically having a um, convolutional neural network not so see I have two hidden layers not go backwards but just talk within one layer to itself only and within then one layer and then okay yeah interesting so the box is one layer one layer and you can have okay. multiple of these boxes but that's usually not necessary well depending on what kind of task you want so each layer could be its own recurrent neural network yes. box yeah, if which, you, which is unnecessary or which... It just requires a lot more computing power. Yeah, it increases yeah. with each box you have. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so GPUs are the best, or TPUs now are yeah. the best. So either graphics processing mm -hmm. units. Or specifically, I forget what TPU says. Tensor. T tensor processing, processing units, units. Yes. What, which are specifically designed for this kind of large-scale matrix multiplication of for machine learning. In David Friedman's lab, we used, I think, eight 2060 TIs uh, in one computer to uh, run our networks. So pretty much top of the line graphics cards, there weren't TPUs, but they were very good. OK, so now what did you do with these recurrent and convolutional neural networks? Which one did you use and what were you doing in the lab at U of Chicago? And then we'll talk about what you're doing here. Yeah, of course. So um, most of my project during the school year focused on implementing latency between each neuron in, um, in the models that we were building. So in a stereotypical neural network, each neuron just instantly, well, as instantly as possible on a computer, instantly communicates to each network, uh, to each neuron down the line. However, in the brain, this isn't actually the case. And for your brain neurons to communicate, it takes about 10 to 40 milliseconds for the signal to travel from one neuron to another. So one of the projects I worked on with the other members of the lab was implementing this kind of late, random ish latency between each neuron. And in the end, it, we implemented it. It didn't exactly lead to, well, no, it led to better results in the specific tasks we were going for. Um, another project I worked on was implementing complex numbers into one of our neural networks. Unfortunately, this didn't exactly work out in our implementation for whatever reason. But we, so these are the kinds of experiments we try in order to make these neurons be more biologically accurate. So there's a 10 to 40 second, millis 10 to 40 millisecond latency between neurons communicating in our brain. Yes. Okay, and then in a neural network, it's even less than that? In an, in, if you don't implement this kind of latency, it's basically each neuron just communicates as fast as possible. As fast as possible. Whatever your time like, step constant is. Oh, and then you can add a latency paradigm to that layer and say that, hey, you have to do this in less than 10 milliseconds. Yes, you can do that. Uh, we specifically said you, we, we specifically made neurons basically hit pause and be like, okay, you have to do this in 35 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds, whatever the specific, whatever for the specific neuron, whatever the value was. So it just makes it slower and mm -hmm. a, which and which is good for recurrent neural networks because then it maybe takes us time to figure out if it's the right not necessarily this isn't necessarily good for if you want fast neural network um, kind of outputs what we were focusing on a lot making these networks be more biologically accurate and having this tell us stuff about the brain okay for example one of the recent papers out of the friedman lab which was before my time uh, but it it was published in June in Nature Neuroscience, was that well, the researchers found by implementing a, a different kind of biological process, they actually found that memory is stored in two different places in the brain, which is very, and one of those places is very hard to measure in an actual human brain, because one of these places is synaptic strengths between neurons, 
And this kind of strength is difficult, if not impossible, to measure because you can't really take a brain apart and look at each of the connection strengths. So by making these kinds of biological kind of testing grounds, we, or labs similar to David Friedman's and of course David Friedman's allow us to actually learn more about the human brain as well. So what would be then aspects of n neural network uh, engineering that would give you these insights into how we store memory in our biology. How did that, how did those discoveries work? So we, uh, we the researchers, um, specifically Nick Mass, who was the first um, author of the paper, and his team focused, uh, made, it had a hypothesis that the working memory, so basically like short-term memory is stored in both neuronal strengths, so, uh, excuse me, yeah, neuronal strengths, which is how strong does your neuron fire, and how often, and synaptic efficacies, which is the strengths of the connections between neurons. And through a lot of math, which I don't really <laughs> know off the top of my head, uh, they were managed to implement both of these processes in neural networks and train them on specific tasks. And what they found was, in order to just memorize information in short-term memory, um, synaptic strengths are used. So the strengths between each neuron. Not the neuron itself, but the strengths between different neurons. But in order to kind of manipulate this information, so like see something and then think about it, or even, or even remember it. So um, that involves the neurons themselves, which is kind of understandable. Cool, cool, okay, and now the idea is that we can then do other forms of neural network engineering to, to get insights about how our biological brains work. Yeah, yeah, this is absolutely just one example out of many others that are currently out there. And what are you interested in doing with neural network <laughs> engineering? And you gave another example of you guys were doing, uh, you were trying to implement, you said real numbers into? Uh, complex numbers, Complex yeah. numbers into, yeah. So there's a real part and an imaginary part. So the real part is just a number that we're usually we're used to thinking about, so like zero through one. Zero through one and all the decimals. Yes. This is the reals. That's the reals, yes. And then the imaginary part is another value from zero to one times i. And i is the square root of negative one. Yeah. So that's what makes it imaginary. And in some implementations of, in the literature that we found, in some implementations this allows for better kind of a better and faster um, neural network processing however in our, our implementation that i worked on this didn't really work and there's a whole slew of reasons why this might have failed and we're not really sure why exactly just in our specific implementation these complex numbers did not work okay yeah, i remember there was something crazy that I was learning about, yeah, what is it, square root of negative yeah. i? Well, negative one, yeah, yeah that's just i. Like square root of negative one is i. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and then I think there was like something else after that, like the quaternions and the octonions or something, I was learning about that, it was so crazy. Yeah. There's a bunch of, of these little like weird mathematical idiosyncrasies that computer scientists and mathematicians and physicists like to uncover, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and hopefully give us insight into the world. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so now, yeah, so let's talk about neural network engineering for biological purposes. So, yeah, what do you what do you want to see happen in that in that field? Where do you see it going right now? What do you want to do in it? I think the be all end all would be to be actually able to simulate an actual human brain within a computer. However, the human brain has many many neurons in the order of hundreds in the order of millions, I think, hundreds of thousands to millions, with the order of trillions of connections between them. And we simply do not have the computing power to first of all even be able to scan a human brain to this kind of um, granularity. And second of all, to be able to simulate this human brain with all of its different connections once we've scanned it. So Neurotransmitters. Yeah, and especially of all of the other cells that are um, in the brain that help the neurons do what they do, some of which um, help secrete neurotransmitters, others um, 
kind of deliver blood, and if you have a stroke, then those kinds of then those neurons near there are impaired. So, I hope that in the near future, the, this will be a possibility, and this will allow us to really understand the human brain to a much better extent once we can simulate it and play around with it, play around with a simulated brain. Um, but we are still very far from that. There's been recent papers that, unfortunately, I forgot the first author of that have simulated a lot of neurons. However, I think it was still only on the scale of 10% of an actual human brain. Mm -hmm. So we're coming closer. Still a lot, wow. Yeah, we're coming closer, but we're still very far away. Uh, and I hope that I will be able to take part in all of this. How did you decide to uh, come out to Peking University this summer? So the University of Chicago has a great program called the Metcalf Program. And the Metcalf program, among all of its other uh, benefits to University of Chicago students, allows, um, will pay students to go out to unpaid internships. And I was interested in going to China, to traveling and studying abroad. And I applied uh, through Handshake, which is the kind of a job search platform that University of Chicago uses, as well as some other universities. I applied to Dr. Lee's lab, and after an, an interview process with uh, uh, Wang who is one of the students here, I was able to come out here. And the University of Chicago, the Metcalf program, sponsors my trip out here, which really is what makes it all possible. Yeah. Interesting. So Metcalf program. So you have uh, potentially you can have wealthy donors or patrons from around the world that sponsor young people to go out over the summers to different parts of the world and meet people and do research there and yeah. make cultural ties happen. Yeah, I like yeah, stuff absolutely. like that. Yeah, I so like it's for a any kind of internship. So whatever whatever you're interested in, the universe, the Metcalf program within certain criteria obviously will sponsor your trip overseas or if you want to stay in Chicago and work in one of the labs there, the, any, uh, any kind of work experience. And then how about engineering fluorescent sensors for neurotransmitters? This is what you're doing right now mm -hmm. in the lab. What does that mean? So we... Uh, like when the cell receives the neurotransmitter, it fluoresces? Exactly, yeah. So we have certain proteins called GPCRs, green uh, fluorescent proteins, which, uh, or sorry, GFPs, green fluorescent proteins, which they light up when there are certain neurotransmitters being in the vicinity or inside the cell. So uh, my project right now is making this, these kinds of cells for oxytocin. We have very good cells for vasopressin, and now we want to make these kinds of sensors for oxytocin. This will be, after this kind of R&D stage, the, this will be very useful to see where these neurotransmitters actually move in the brain. And this will allow us to study kind of the brain more in depth. Currently, I work with E. coli. After a certain kind of testing stage, and once we have good enough sensors, we inject them into mice. And then we study these mice and in vivo, and we see how they respond, or how th their brains respond to these kinds of chemicals. So you, you end up taking a decent amount of your background. How did you, how, how did, okay, I see. So it's the neuroscience, like, background for you, because it's not too much, uh, Neural networks, mm -hmm. yeah, on yeah. The, on the computational side for you right now. Mm -hmm. So you're actually working on engineering the sensors for oxytocin. Yes. Okay, so when a neuron receives oxytocin, you're going to light it up with, GFP is going to light it up. Yeah. And so then you're, you are engineering that right now in E. coli. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, we make, the, we make the proteins and we introduce them in plasmids and then have the E. coli express them and then do a bunch of imaging tests and then see what, what are the best candidates and repeat and go from there. Okay, and then, and then that gets injected into mice. Eventually, yeah. We package yeah. them into viruses and these viruses deliver. Into mice. Uh, yeah, into mice neurons specifically, yeah. And then, and then how does 
then you have to then you image the mouse's brain to see the fluorescence. Yes. For specifically oxytocin, so then it has to have some sort of like a, like a, like a female mouse has to come up or something like that. Something like that, yeah. or, uh, well, we haven't done this for oxytocin, so in the E. coli stage, but for other kinds of sensors, you would either stimulate it with, uh, stimulate the mouse with something, or you just simply inject the drug into the brain, and see if it works. And then. So you gave us this example earlier with the strength of simulation software being able to make a human brain and some mm -hmm. teams already doing 10% of the human brain. Does it feel like we're already in a simulation? Uh, <laughs> sorry, this question caught me a little bit off guard. Um, I don't know, I don't know if if we are in a simulation, I don't know if it's possible to know this. And even if we are in a simulation, who's to say that our so-called creators aren't in a simulation themselves, right? Um, it doesn't, uh, so these, the, this, sure, yes, hypothetically we could be, and we could never know it. But I don't think this, is, this really affects my specific worldview, because we just don't know, and it's better to just not assume we are in a simulation and that this is the real thing and kind of experience life from the perspective of this is the only chance we get and the, this is the, again, real kind of experience as opposed to it's, it, it, of it's not just fake and created for somebody's, I don't know, research project. <laughs> it seems like the computational capacity is increasing in unleashing super intelligences and quantum computing is gonna be enabling us to run our own simulations of brains and of civilizations and of all different types of things and then that's gonna give us deeper insight into our own source code of this reality. And that'll be a very fun awakening moment for, for many of us. And I don't think those things have to be exclusive like living life with a deep amount of meaning and passion and then whether or not this is a simulation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you can always live life with deep meaning and passion and purpose, regardless if it is or is not a simulation. What would the... skill that young people should know going into the exponential technology age be? Singular skill? Um, I think privacy, it's not specifically a skill, but it's a really important mindset to have, especially with nothing that you put on the internet really ever being deleted. And um, especially for my generation and the generation right after me, where everything is recorded and everything is always on your phones, I think privacy is a really important concern. We have scandals of uh, Cambridge Analytica recently, as well as kind of the antitrust in, uh, in focus on Google, as well as other big corporations now that have a lot of our own data and what we do. So it's important to, I think, be knowledgeable that about kind of what you post on the internet may come back and haunt you and bite you later. But on the other hand, it's also important now to have a healthy kind of social life um, on these social networks because the, if anyone is, for example, an interviewer, if an interviewer is looking for you and tries to do some kind of background research, then having these experiences on these social networks and kind of posting the good moments from your life is also really important to show that, uh, to show what you've done and kind of what kind of person you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was good seeing your piano videos <laughs> yeah, on, on the you. internet. Yeah, and your, you know, your profile on LinkedIn at least gave me a little bit more of a background on you. At the same time, I like seeing people post themselves completely transparently, like not just the good, but also the struggles and the challenges and things like that. And I myself do that. Yeah, um, absolutely. That helps a lot too. It shows real humanity. It shows vulnerability. It shows, um, it's good to talk about triumphs over those challenges because they can inspire other people to, to do the same. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting thinking about going into a completely transparent world 
and it's also thinking interesting about quantum encryption and all of the privacy safe world at the same time so it's kind of like hmm can we build that love trust and affinity for each other across the world can we not need such military budgets and regimes can we ascend our consciousness to more harmonize together around the planet on that question how do you think we can inspire people around the world to work together to i think um mm, there's different you can kind of do this differently for different goals so if you i think science is a really good example of this where you have scientists from all over the world writing papers and reading the papers on, of their peers that may not even be on the same continent or hemisphere. So you have this huge kind of collection of people that are indirectly working together. And I think if we have this f for similar, uh, have similar kinds of things for other kinds of fields of study or walks of life, I guess, the, this could be, uh, this could lead to very uh, good kind of outcomes. So you have maybe for let's say the hard case, let's say politicians, right? So you have a lot of countries with competing interests and I think if there was more kind of transparency between um, the I issues of one country with another or uh, even the wants and desires of one country over the other, you could have reach more peaceful resolutions, going back to what we talked about at the start of this interview of kind of more communication between parties. Yeah, so I think it all boils down to a healthy amount of communication and transparency in certain areas. What do you think is the overall meaning of this human experiment? Well, but what do you mean by experiment? No, so human I'm not experiment, that, human experience, mm -hmm. both of them, what is the meaning of it? I think um, on an individual level, I think the meaning is what you give it really, of, for example, of and I'm very happy studying and doing and conducting research, so the meaning it would uh, the meaning for me might be something along the lines of i I want to create or I want to do more research or I want to kind of find the answers to these questions, this list of questions. Um, someone else who finds satisfaction and purpose in doing other things that that may be their meaning of life i don't I don't know if there is a meaning of life for it necessarily all of us that is the same thing but I think on an individual level you can definitely find something that makes you happy and content. Do you think consciousness is a biological phenomenon? I think we well yes the short answer is yes the long answer is we don't know <laughs> of what exactly consciousness is it's very hard to define um, we know we have it we know rocks don't have it probably and that's what that's what we've got um, does it come, it comes from the brain, where in the brain, how in the brain, great open-ended questions in neuroscience right now. Do you think you have free will? I'd like to live my life believing I do, <laughs> because uh, at least in my personal experience, I don't, I, I choose to live as if that, that my choices really do matter and I have, that I am the one making these choices and it's not some deterministic path that I've been sent down by. Yeah, that I've just been set down. What do you think is the role of love in life? Um, well, there's many different kinds of love, right? There's parental love, there's kind of fraternal or brotherly sibling love. There's obviously amorous love. Um, so I think different kinds of love have different kinds of roles. Um, the parental love of, or kind of in-family dynamics are very important to kind of culture and well-being, uh, obviously in more personal uh, amorous relationships are also very important. What, the role of love, I don't know, I don't think I can classify it into one. Oh, this is the role of love. To be happy, I guess, maybe. <laughs> I don't have the answer to this question, I'm sorry. This is why we ask. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Hmm. Most beautiful thing. Um, <laughs> very similar answer. There are many different kinds of beauty, I feel. 
Um, I'm a pianist. I love listening to other performers and musicians, especially those that are at the peaks of a peaks of their careers, and who are the best at what they do. They create beauty at their instrument. Um, there's beauty in arts. There's beauty in culture. There's you know there's beauty in just people. Um, the mo I, I don't know if I can say of something like lines of this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yeah. 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 Your 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 you being a pianist is also very interesting because in many ways that has a lot of computational properties itself as mm -hmm. well. There's specific notes that are played, there's specific space between the notes, there's the length of the note, there's where is the note being played on the scale. There's so many aspects of the combinatorics of yeah. music. And that's very similar with uh, with computer science or with neuroscience. So it seems like those things really mesh together well for building out a worldview, music and science. Yeah, we, we've known this for a while actually, that the same area of the brain that is activated when you play or listen to music is the same area of the brain which is activated when you do math. So doing one makes you good at good and more precise and better at the other as well. So they're very intimately tied. And a lot of, or at least in my experience, a lot of doctors that I've known do play kind of a, play an instrument of some sort. And they're good at it too. Yeah. Anthony, yeah, thanks for coming on to our show. This yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's been super fun. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, check out the links in the bio below, youlonglylab.org, also Anthony's LinkedIn profile. Also have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about neural networks and about neuroscience and about the future of all of these fields. Have more conversations about it. And also, Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. You can contribute to us. Patreon, PayPal, cryptocurrency, all those links are below. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. It's a wrap, my man. Good job. All right. Thank you, dude. That, that was, was great. Lot, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah.